Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Chrysler. And by Hyundai. Learn more at Hyundai.com. This is Auto Line After Hours with Gary Vaslash, episode 291 for June 12th, 2015. Crazy about Camaro. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific or 19 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, John is obviously not here, so you have me again. Um, so we will venture on, but I have stalwart support, Jim McCraw. How are you doing, Jim? Very well, Gary. Thank you. Welcome. Been a long time since we've had you on the show. Indeed. But since we're going to be talking. That's why my throat is so dry. <clears throat> you've been waiting anxiously. So since we're going to be talking about a uh, hot car, you're the guy. We like those. We, and you like those. I know you do. Very much. From back in your days at Hot Rod Magazine. We'll get to him. We'll get to him. I'm talking about you. <laughs> yes. So, knowledgeable. Chris Pockert. Great Chris, to be here. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. How you been? I've been great. Yeah? Been great, yeah. There's okay. been a few convertible days now and again. Uh, we're right in that sweet spot for temperature for me, so. Right. Very nice. Okay. So, now we've got the guy that everybody's watching to see and hear, Al Oppenheiser, who is the chief engineer of Gen 6 Camaro. That's right. Which was just unveiled to the world last month. Right. Yes. Thanks, Gary. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, okay, tell us about this exciting car. So, so from the point of view of the chief engineer, what is the coolest part of the new car? I think the coolest part of the new car is that uh, we took what worked so well in the fifth generation Camaro, and um, we took it to another level. And a couple areas specifically are the, um, the fact that Camaro customers love to personalize their car. Uh, you go to a Camaro show and they'll come and tell you what they did to your car and they, they name them, they're, they're part of their family. Um, it's personalization. So we've really listened and, and the sixth gen has a lot of personalization cues on it. And then of course, um, the big story would be that we're starting out on a clean slate with a new architecture that starts out at least 200 pounds lighter than the one it replaces. So, correct me if I'm wrong, that you have two carryover parts, the SS badge for the right. SS model <laughs> and the rear bow tie logo. That's right. That's, That's right. It. That's it. So this is, this, is, this is the proverbial clean sheet car. This is all new. That's right. Yeah, we... Um, we, we have the DNA of all five generations, but uh, as far as actually carrying over part numbers, that's it. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, now you guys have an array of engines that hadn't been offered before. We do. Uh, of course, there's the LT1, the 6.2 liter uh, V8, which as we announced a couple weeks ago is 455 horsepower. Pretty nice engine in a 200 pound lighter car. <laughs> you can start to calculate some numbers. Um, we've got an all new V6, which uh, all new being um, all new part numbers, but uh, in addition to the direct injection and the variable valve timing, um, it now has active fuel management. So it shuts down six to four when you're cruising. Um, so it has better fuel economy than the predecessor. Um, and actually has more horsepower at 335 horsepower. And then, of course, for the first time ever, we're introducing a turbocharged engine in a Camaro, um, and we are introducing it in a two-liter turbo four-cylinder engine. So, so what's the thinking behind the turbo? I mean, why did you decide that this was the time that it was a be a... Uh, good question, today? and we get asked that a lot. Um, of course, uh, I think one of the biggest wins on the fifth generation was the fact that we partnered with uh, Michael Bay and did the Transformers movie, so every <laughs> kid that was five on up knows what Bumblebee is. And that generation's grown up accepting, loving, modifying four-cylinder engines. Um, we actually had a lot of people ask us in the fifth gen, why aren't you doing something with a two-liter turbo? Um, we're also preparing for future fuel economy requirements where we're going to be challenged to meet corporate responsible fuel economy numbers. Um, 
and frankly, it's uh, it's a great engine. And uh, I, I tell the story about uh, my personal um, thoughts on the two liter being put in the Camaro a couple of years back. Um, I got called in the office by my boss, and he closed the door and introduced me to some powertrain folks. And I said, well, I know all the powertrain guys. I listed off all the V8 chiefs and the <laughs> V6 chiefs. And I said, wait a minute, you're, you're the four-cylinder guys. And they says, you know, it's time, to, it's time to pour you some Kool-Aid. So you fast forward to last fall. We were over in Germany doing some testing at the Nürburgring and the Autobahn and some of the great German country roads. And it was an overcast day. We weren't using the track, so I filled up the four-cylinder engine and went out and tested on the Autobahn. I ran a full tank of fuel, and I came back and got out of the car and I said, this thing's a rock star. It really is. And I think that uh, the people that have grown up with four-cylinder engines completely accept them. They're going to be there, but I think it's going to grow a new um, acceptance of uh, turbocharged four-cylinders in this segment. Mm -hmm. How much weight do you get off the nose when you go down from the V6 to the turbo four? It's approximately the same ballpark. The, the mass is approximately the same. And by the way, the, the, um, the base Camaros, the non-V8s, are, are, are nearly 300 pounds lighter than the fifth gens they replace. And they have more equipment. And you get more equipment, yeah. more technology, better performance. How much of that is due to the size difference? This is an, an all-new platform for this car. Um, it's, it's a little bit tighter dimensionally. It is. Um, the first thing you see when you come up on the 6th gen is obviously the styling. Got a lot of the DNA of Camaro, but we've taken it more athletic, more chiseled. You'll see some great feature lines in it. Um, it highlights the fact that the architecture itself is lighter. It's, it's um, the architecture that uh, Cadillac, ATS, and CTS have been based off of. Um, very highly efficient, very structurally sound. Um, Great use of uh, lightweight materials, uh, aluminum front suspension components, aluminum hood, and so on. When you start adding up uh, the benefits of, of uh, 200 plus pounds lighter, um, you're, you're starting out with a pallet that we, we, uh, we uh, would have desired anything different on the fifth gen, we would have liked to take more mass out, and this gives us the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's just a slightly tighter package. Um, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, the, it's, the... it's roughly... Uh, basically just less than two inches in all the key dimensions right. in the fifth gen. And, and the width is barely just over an inch. I mean, so it's, it's just, just tighter and, and lower. And lower. So it looks wider and right. it's more planted. Well, but one of the key dimensions for a, a performance car like a Camaro is track width, and we didn't want to give up track width just going to the smaller uh, dimensions. And so we've grown the uh, track width to be nearly what the fifth gen Camaro is. Um, uh, again, we didn't want to compromise that. So you got track width, grip, mm -hmm. horsepower. We got all the right attributes here, but track width we weren't going to give up on. Mm -hmm. Now I want to talk about you know before we get away from the, the powertrain. So the so the LT1 is the Corvette engine. Correct. And now is what had been the the most powerful engine that was in a Camaro prior to this? Well, the fifth gen had the LSA, which is a 580 horsepower supercharged engine. Mm -hmm. um, that was the highest horsepower, most powerful engine we had in a Camaro mm -hmm. in any of the five generations. Um, the, uh, the quickest performing Camaro we ever had was our Z28, which was the uh, LS7, the seven liter, mm -hmm. 505 horsepower. That's a, that's a monster as well. Mm -hmm. So presumably these are things that you have kicking around in your mind at some point in time. I mean, I don't know. Do you think we should do performance variants I, off the Camaro? We, we we talk about it. We're not quite sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could make you could you could make like an electric version or hybrid. No, well, I that's don't. instant you torque, get, right? <laughs> that, that is true. Uh, no, we we uh, although we're not here to share our future portfolio, right. it would be remiss if we didn't say we're always looking for ways to keep keep uh, grabbing the attention and keep. Mm -hmm. pushing the performance envelope. Mm -hmm. What were the key attributes you wanted to improve in this new generation? I know, you know, when you get your whiteboard out and you say, we're, we're fine in, the, in these aspects, but we really need to improve in this, this, and this. What were the, the things that needed improving? Uh, well, the first thing was mass. Um, in the fifth generation, and the fifth generation is such a phenomenal car. Um, I'll do a little plug. It has still been the best-selling performance car in the last five years. Um, 
but it did get saddled with mass. And so having this new architecture has been fantastic to work with. So that checks, uh, checks the box right away. Um, the other things were the um, uh, interior. The interior of the fifth generation nearly matched identical that beautiful concept Camaro we showed in Detroit in 2006 that Bob Lutz and Ed Welburn uh, you know, put so much into. Um, however, uh, after six years, it's, it's, um, it's time to go up to another level. Um, so you'll see in the new Camaro that uh, we've really made the, uh, the interior a key part of the car. You'll see these uh, very functional lower HVAC outlets that uh, are single and dual zone, depending on which one you, you, you uh, select. Um, great use of materials with uh, um, leather, um, uh, soft touch paint, uh, really has gone another level of refinement for the car. That was another key. There's some pictures. Yeah, there's some showing. beautiful pictures. Uh, just the, the overall styling, I think, um, it's, it's going to really blow people away. We've, we've, we've gone down to the details of uh, uh, the interface with the shifter. Um, we've gone to electronic park brake in the 6th gen. And yes, you can't do your Jim Rockford moves anymore, but um, <laughs> we were able to offset the cup holders, which was one of the things that we learned in the 5th gen. There's people that drive with uh, soft drinks and whatever, and, and uh, it's tough to shift the manual with cup holders mm -hmm. right away. So we've been able to work on the console to um, improve the cup holder location. The shifter bouquet is, is perfectly attuned to the, all the different types of drivers, whether you're a pistol grip driver um, or you know, grab it at the top. Um, the, the generous use of, um, of leather, vinyl, um, is, is really gonna show itself strong. And, and these pictures are, are very nice. There you see the HVAC vents, which uh, that's a dual zone example, but those are functional. Um, we got a beautiful 8-inch screen, you'll see there, which um, we're incorporating some of the new technology that um, you heard Mary Barra talk about a couple weeks ago with the projection mm -hmm. for iPhones and, and Android. Um, and, and you'll see there um, a quick glimpse of the cluster, the beautiful two-shot molded cluster that retains what needs to be in a sports car of uh, analog gauges and the... Uh, Secondary uh, gauges that we want to put on there can be digital. And there you see quickly, um, uh, I mentioned personalization. We're offering a 24 color palette where you can tune the interior colors to your personal liking. Um, we've got uh, a mode switch that uh, gives you uh, four different modes. Um, if you get the V8, snow ice, tour, sport, and track. Um, there is a color selection that we picked for those modes. However, if you don't like orange for track mode, you can go in and select green or pink or white, whatever you want. So the customization is really going to be something our customers love, um, and, and it, it'll let them know that we really listen to them. I want to ask you about these modes. So, okay, I pick the track mode. What happens to my car? Okay, when you pick track mode, it adjusts. If you get the um, active exhaust, which is now electronic valves versus vacuum, um, you get a valve selection of basically open, open uh, valves. Um, you get a steering calibration. You get a throttle progression. Um, you get an interior lighting selection, um, all geared towards uh, track mode. Mm -hmm. um, if you switch over to sport, um, you get a different steering setting, uh, throttle progression, different lighting mode, um, uh, and... Um, uh, exhaust note. Mm -hmm. um, we do Nothing all in the suspension itself, though you don't have mag shocks. Or the uh, that's a great question, Jim. <clears throat> We're bringing the magnetic ride control, or the magnetological ride control, um, from the ZL1 of today. We're bringing it into the SS as an option. Uh, we had a lot of feedback that it's a great. Uh, a lot of people actually drive that car and think it's a great feature for just driving around Michigan roads, not necessarily <laughs> tracking the car. Mm -hmm. And so we're making it available for them as an option on the SS. The Belgian blocks known as Michigan roads. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, a great feature. Has visibility improved at all? I know that the you know the chopped roof line and the high cowl belt line is is one of the hallmarks of the design. But getting in and out of the car, it's it's hard to see out of. 
Yeah, I think one of the things that um, we learned from uh, talking to our customers is uh, we asked them, would you like us to lower the belt line or raise the roof line or change the, the windshield angle we were talking about earlier? Mm -hmm. And they all said, oh, no, 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 don't touch the styling. It's the number one reason they buy a car, buy a Camaro. Um, they said, fix it with technology. So we've got the rear park assist, the rear camera. Um, we have better up vision in the sixth gen than the fifth gen has. Um, you'll see when you get in it, a guy as tall as Jim can get in and it really envelops them. It's not cramped. Got plenty of room for your, to rest your arm on the console, on the door trim. It's a lower belt line. Um, it's not, uh, it, it's better uh, uh, designed for you to drive with your arm out the window. So overall, um, it's still not going to please everybody. Mm -hmm. But then again, if you ask them, should we change it for you? They'll say, don't touch a thing. No. So we have a phone call that uh, someone would like to uh, presumably ask you something okay. else. So bring it in, Ben. Hello, this is George from Sunnyvale. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the styling of the, the new Camaro. It seems very similar to the existing car. Uh, in particular, the glass area, you know, the very, very narrow or low height glass, uh, so, so, and which was an issue with the pre with current car, as that uh, people said it was almost like looking at a gun slits or giving them a claustrophobic feeling from being inside, and you still stayed with that, uh, even though this was your chance to correct that. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, we, as I mentioned before, uh, the, uh, the styling of a Camaro, the DNA of a Camaro has always been a long dash to axle and an aggressive windshield angle. Um, you start changing that, you, you start to go away from what makes a Camaro a Camaro. Um, so we did other things like we lowered the belt line, we gave you more room inside so you got the feeling of spaciousness even though, even though it's narrower by almost two inches than the car it replaces. Um, you mentioned correct that. Um, I'm not so sure we did something wrong in the fifth gen. Like I said, we've we've sold uh, 550,000 of these things, so um, we did take small incremental changes. Uh, it's got better up vision. Um, our, our our sun visors um, they now have a detent full forward so that um, the shorter drivers can get the sun blockage but still have more up vision. Um, I think maybe to answer your question uh, in, in, in one statement, I would say that uh, the best thing to do is as soon as you get to an area where you can see the car in person, uh, it, will, it will change your opinion of seeing it in pictures. It's one of these that... Um, yeah, I mean, you, you just look at it and you say, wait a minute, that's, that's classic Camaro. And if you, change, if you monkey too much with it, that it, right. it, would, it would not be what it is. And I think that just seeing it in person, and, and these pictures do a great job, but um, the chiseled lines on the exterior, you really see the athleticism. And when you see one next to the other, you'll see that you can tell the difference. It's almost like a 7 eight scale of the fifth gen. Um, I, I know uh, my communication folks don't like when I use this reference, but those of us old enough to remember Rocky, the first Rocky, he's mm -hmm. a big brute and beat everybody up. By Rocky III, man, he was lean, mean, and was called maybe a middleweight. Uh, it's kind of what the sixth gen is. It's, it's agile, lean, athletic, faster, stronger. So I want to ask you, I mean, one of the points that you guys have been making is the fact that you spent 350 hours in the wind tunnel. You talked about the, the forms and the shapes and the exterior of this car. Is, is that a lot? You know, we talked about that when we wrote that number down. Will people know what that means? Um, the 350 hours contained within that is a lot of graveyard shifts. We have a, a, just a fantastic Camaro team that will voluntarily work the midnight shift that nobody else wants to all night in the wind tunnel, just making minor changes to get one cubic meter per, per um, minute of air flow through the grill. So we'll make a radius change, you'll retest it. And so we've got aggressive arrow numbers um, for lift, for downforce, front rear downforce balance. Um, every time we make a change, we'll go back in and verify it. We use a lot of um, uh, computational fluid dynamics models. Mm -hmm. um, so is it a lot? It's a lot. It's, it's basically uh, uh, 24 hours a day until we get the styling right and get physical properties, and then we go back and, and validate what we did with the physical properties on the track. Mm -hmm. so, so they said that, that one of the things was to reduce the drag on the LT and to improve the downforce on the SS. So ex explain that. Right, well, um, 
because we have to balance our fuel economy numbers, um, you want to you want to add um, lift to a point on your entry models to help your fuel economy, whereas you don't want that on your up-level models to maximize downforce. Um, so we, we have a good balance from our 4, 6, and 8, uh, where the models are that need, it, need the uh, lift for fuel economy um, are balanced against the ones that we don't want it for the downforce to get the track times. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's depending on which powertrain you have, which trim level you have, right. and what the car is likely to do under uh, right. and, uh, driving conditions. And, and we, we, we take advantage of that by having the differentiation in the styling as well of the LT um, up to the SS. Okay. All right, so we are going to take a quick break here and hear from our friends at Bridgestone Firestone, and then we will be back. And I got a whole bunch of questions here from uh, those of you out there, and we got you guys here, so uh, we'll get to all these. We'll do it really rapidly. Firestone Destination LE2. <laughs> Tough enough to handle anything the road throws at you. Oops. And you throw at it. Durable, dependable Firestone tires. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Okay, we're back with uh, Al Oppenheiser, Chief Engineer of the uh, Camaro, and Chris Pockert, and my good friend Jim McCraw here. So, we've got another... Uh, Phone call. Ben, could you please bring that in? Uh, this is Clem Zorowski in Delmont, Pennsylvania. As an owner of an original 68 and 69 Z28 back in the day when they were new, when is Chevy coming out or are they planning on coming out with a high winding 8,000 RPM small displacement engine for these cars? Uh, I know these uh, big Corvette engines make lots of power, but I think a lot of people like myself would rather have something that turns 82 to 8,500 RPM when you're going through the gears. Thank you. Yeah, he's, no question. He's, uh, <laughs> they are a lot of fun. Um, he's talking about a flat plane crank engine. And, uh, you know, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we have the best performance lineup in the industry with uh, our Chev SS, the Corvette, and the Camaro. And so we're going to continue to push the boundaries. Uh, I, I won't commit to what we're trying, but uh, there's always room for uh, taking a look at new technologies and uh, anything to do with performance. You know, sign us up. Okay. So you're going to. Have, there's a whole bunch of questions about performance. So okay. I'll warn you right now, and you can. So All right. You can. You can Somebody like, out there in in listener viewer land wants the five liter pushrod engine back from the '67 '68. Oh, really? C28 high winder, okay. right? That, that's what that sounded like to me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so Oak Cabin asks, will we ever see a more street version of the Z28? Hmm, a more street version. Well, isn't I that the he, one LE? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I think he means uh, not a $75,000 one. <laughs> uh, um, I tell you, it's the king of the hill right now. Mm -hmm. It was uh, best driver's car for a good reason. Um, and I don't think you could build that car up to the performance level it is for 75 grand on the street. Um, but, but the nice uh, thing is you can do it if you want to because yeah, of the absolutely. way you we have the, performance the whole parts. parts program. Right, but Jim, you had a great point. The 1LE is uh, probably the hidden gem of the Camaro lineup. It's a, about a $3,500 option that uh, does sub three minutes at VIR. There's your streetable version. All right. <laughs> Um, Runner asks, I want to slip in a hyper-theoretical question on the existence of a coming mid-engine Corvette. Seen any mysterious vehicles around the shop? GM needs something to counter the new Ford GT, regardless of certain people's denials. After all, Corvette's image never hurts Camaro. Surely the chief engineer of Camaro is allowed to speculate on a non-existent Corvette. Who was that, Eisenstein? That was the <laughs> long question. <laughs> There'd be a follow-up. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, uh, was there a question in there? I don't know. All right. <clears throat> uh, Chuck Renenzi asks, 
was there ever a discussion about making the 2016 Camaro even smaller than what was ultimately decided upon? Based on the ATS platform, I felt that the downsizing should have taken at least one more step and also a couple, another couple hundred pounds lighter. Wow. Well, we're already, like I said, over 200 pounds just on our V8, nearly 300 pounds on the V6. Mm -hmm. That's a magnitude lighter. I mean, I know I'd be a lot faster the, if I dropped The chief engineer pounds. at lunch one day was talking about the CTS program, and he said, my guys were running up and down all over the car looking for grams. Yeah, we actually it took, took the work that the Cadillac folks did and went even further as well on um, the same vein. We counted the number of threads you need exposed on every fastener, and if you didn't need more than three or four, you cut them off. We go wow. after grams. Wow. And you still have a favorable weight to power ratio versus the competition right now. We do. Yeah. Um, Racical blank via Twitter. How tuner friendly is the four cylinder turbo and how much power can it make? Just an idea, please. Well, there's uh, performance numbers, performance options that are, are probably that, that abound. Um, we have we're not here to talk about any today, but. Uh, and Jim remembers when we ran the uh, salt flats programs with the uh, Ecotech engines back in the uh, mid 90s. Uh, we did wonderful things uh, from crate engines all the way up to 1,000 horsepower twin turbo. So there's plenty that can be done with a two liter turbo, and uh, I, I uh, welcome and can't wait to see what our customers do with that. Uh, what is the, to clarify that, what is the relationship between? that engine and this engine no, nothing there's there's no relationship other than maybe heritage um this is all new um you know we're like i said we're, we're getting 276 horsepower out of this thing which is more horsepower than the v8s from 1971 to 1995 so mm -hmm. it's there's no excuse there at all and you mentioned the salt flats and we're talking about the importance of performance can you talk about the importance of motorsports to camaro as a brand and, and what you're going to be doing in that regard it's been great on the fifth gen um working with the performance team mark dickens and mark kent jim campbell's organization we've been able to do a great job of um, when we build a version like a 1le or a z28 we have performance parts available um, then we showcase them in uh, World Challenge and some of the other circuits that are, they're, they're getting podium finishes nearly every week. So the tie is there, and I think uh, the Camaro as a preferred uh, vehicle in a lot of those racing sanctioned um, race events uh, is just gonna continue to grow. Um, someone that almost has your handle, Chris. I love my Miata asks, <laughs> is the new Camaro expected to perform well in the IIH S small overlap crash test. Uh, we are going to uh, we're going to be a great performer on all of those metrics. Okay. Um, right Knight says, being that the new Camaro is built on a version of the Alpha Pro platform, will there ever be a high performance all wheel drive version of the Camaro? Perhaps called the RSS for Rally Super Sport. And he adds, why not offer? a non-SS version with a tuned 400 horsepower 5.3 liter V8. <laughs> I'm oh. sorry, Gary, but he's not allowed to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what would you think, Jim? <laughs> well, there, it's, it's just a wonderful platform to, to go play with over mm -hmm. a few years. And um, those cars, the special drag race packages, they're going to get worn out or change classes sooner or later. They have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. They're doing too well not to be replaced. <laughs> so the drag pack and the 1LE and the Z28 are, you know, that's just part of the Camaro thing, mm -hmm. we can assume. Mm -hmm. But he can't say that. That's right. <laughs> but the all-wheel drive question is interesting. I mean, <clears throat> there's always a vocal minority of people that want all-wheel drive and everything, right. but it's not. It's clearly not part of this car's heritage. Do you think people would be accepting of that? Uh, I think, of course, there would be somebody accepting. This caller would be accepting of one, <laughs> so there's one we'd sell. But um, I think there... Of course, but I think we have to stay true to the DNA of the Camaro. And I think in the fifth generation, we really locked down some um, definitions of what a 1LE track package is. We, have, you know, we had 1LEs back in the third gen that were brakes and suspension bits. And I think we paid homage to that with our fifth gen. Um, the LSA was an aluminum block high horsepower engine um, you know, that we had like in 69. Um, the Z28, 
that that is such a uh, legendary name and I think the fifth generation sealed that it means all about track performance so I don't personally see an all-wheel drive fitting in a Camaro it doesn't mean we would never look at one but uh, you're talking a new floor pan you're starting to talk about complexity that be behind the scenes what the customer sees starts to really inflate the cost of doing a car like that now, I'd like to ask you about the homologation process for the, specifically for the Z28. Is that all done? You can run the thing almost in any sanctioning body with the, the normal appropriate, you know, Current roll, roll yeah. cage, fuel cell. Right. Some of the, some of the um, bodies um, don't care for the carbon ceramic brakes, but you can put the six pistons on and absolutely it's ready to go right from the showroom. This, this sort of gets to the I think part of your answer with regard to the all-wheel drive um, question, AAH guest 694 wants to know, um, aren't you concerned that somebody makes a spacious four-door sedan that vastly out accelerates the fastest Camaro? I'm thinking about Tesla. <laughs> Why not make an all-electric all-wheel drive Camaro so you could come at least close to matching Tesla? I actually have a good answer for that. <laughs> we are partnering with the government in Argonne and 16 universities for the Eco Car 3 Challenge. It's a four-year uh, program with uh, these university students who are engineers and are looking at high fuel economy, low emission vehicles. Um, they basically get um, a four-year development plan with a Camaro. They've, we, they've chosen a Camaro as their project car. Um, and they've got to do great things uh, of invention. Um, and clearly, if they come up with something that you would actually consider in the Camaro, we would actually look at it. Um, it's a great program. Um, I, I uh, was fortunate enough to be a part of their first year ceremony last year in Seattle. And there are some great things coming from the university students. So I, I wouldn't rule it out in the future. So that's, that's great if you got young people who are interested in Camaros. I mean, so. It's, uh, it's a great tie. It's a, it's a, it's a bright future for uh, performance cars going forward. Absolutely. So, Al, we want to thank you very much for being uh, on the show with us this afternoon. Well, it's been great. Uh, very fascinating stuff, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to getting behind the wheel of that uh, sixth-generation Camaro. Yes, the Absolutely. sooner the better. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So we're going to be hearing from our friends at Chrysler. So thank you. There is no royal blood in this country. Nothing is reserved for anyone. It's all just out there, waiting for someone to reach out and take it. And the ones who do, these are the kings and queens of America. Okay, so um, next week's show, Craig Metros, exterior designer of the Ford GT. I know Craig. I've talked to Craig. Um, I think you don't want to miss that show. Um, those of you who regularly watch the program know that uh, we had uh, Camillo Pardo on the show uh, a few months ago, and that question could possibly be answered by our new special guest. John has arrived. I'm back. John is in the back. studio. Right. So we had Camillo on the show, what, three or four months ago? Something like that, right. And uh, so, okay, um, I think this will be the opportunity where I know that all of you people are anxious to, uh, to see what crazy numbers I have come up with this week. <laughs> and so we'll do that, and then we'll get into a discussion of all manner of things. Now I've got to find my sheet, because as you all know, the famous Blue Notebook has all kinds of things. You're, all like, right. you're like Karnak he, with he, the envelopes. Except for I've got all this so stuff. so much time organizing his three-ring binder. It's, you know, I just, <laughs> just got to do it that way. So anyway, so here's the thing. So there's this outfit called Glassdoor, and it's, it's basically a, a job site sort of thing. and um, or in employment operation. And they do a survey of the top 50 CEOs at large companies, okay? And so these are, they, they survey real people who work at these real companies. So this isn't like us giving our opinions on uh, whomever, okay? So the top 50. So um, the, the number one 
on the list is Google's Larry Page. He has 97% approval, okay? As a boss. As a boss. As by a CEO, Google people. Admired by, by other CEOs. No, 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 by Google people. Oh. So you work for him. Oh. Okay, so these you like people. Peer review, as it were. Blue Sky Production people saying, how do they like John? No, we're not going to put that link All right, all right. So, so, so Larry Page is tied, and for, for whatever reason, Nike's Mark Parker is, has 97% approval, but he's listed as second, okay? Number three is HEB's Charles Butt. Now, HEB, I believe, is a supermarket chain that mm -hmm. you can find in, in places South, like Texas yeah. and, and so on, and they even have uh, their version of a cola and so on and so forth. Okay, he's number three, 96% approval. Number four, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, 95% approval. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was number four. Number five, and I've never even heard of this company before, Ultimate Software's Scott Shearer is actually tied with Mark Zuckerberg, 95% approval. Now, here's a question for you guys. Put your thinking caps on. Last year, Alan Mulally was ranked number two. Okay, so we went through this list. Mulally was number two. Which automotive CEO made the top 50 in this year's list? Okay, Chris. Uh, I'm going to guess Mary. Mary Barra? Yeah. And just where, would, where would she be on this top 50 list? In the lower third. The lower third. Jim. Voted by employees? By employees. Marchione. Marchione, and where would he be? Top 25. Top 25, so you're putting him above Barrow, who's now in the low 30s. Or no, she'd be Lower the, third, yeah. Lower uh, third. Yeah. All right, John? I, I'm with Chris. I think Mary Barra, and I think she'd be probably ranked lower than some of these other execs. And if I had a drum roll, which we don't, the answer is no one. Oh. There isn't a single automotive CEO that is on the list. You sandbagged us. Did they? I did sandbag did they Surveyed the automotive companies. Mulally was number two last year. Well, but he'd been gone for two years. But he was—he was no. He was Al Mulally of Ford. I'm actually not terribly surprised with that. Really? I'm perfectly honest with you. Yeah. Why? Well, companies never score well in any of these surveys. Yeah. I think when people get like a, a cult of personality around them, that's why I kind of went with Barra because you know first female executive, uh, right? Chief executive. Um, I, I, I think they have tremendously complicated jobs um, at these companies with all the regulatory pressures and, and you know, all the different things. It's probably a more complicated job than even running Apple or, or Google. Jim, Jim's looking very, very vexed here. Well, the, these are big universes. You know, hmm. 180,000 people working for some car company. So you have the very dark blue collar, the blue collar, the light blue collar, the light white collar, and then the serious money people. Mm -hmm. So who, who did they ask? The line workers at the plants in Kansas City? Uh, you know, I question the methodology when it comes to very large companies. Well, but Google's That, that do small. a lot of things. So anyway, let's move on from that. Nobody. Because it yeah. Nope. Not a single. Not a single one. Not a, not a supplier, not an OEM. Nary a musk to be found. <laughs> Nary a musk to be found. See, there, that's a surprise. That is a bit of a surprise, actually. That, that he, well, but maybe they don't really like him that much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Moving right I along. Could, uh, all right. Um, all right, so I, I thought this was interesting, and, and I know that you guys uh, reported on this on, uh, on AutoLine Daily. Um, the Costco Auto Program, mm -hmm. and uh, so so General Motors and Costco had this 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 um, scheme deal put together, and um, so they had a, a promotion between October first and January second, covering seventeen select twenty fourteen and twenty fifteen Chevys, Cadillacs, Buicks, and GMC models, and it offered basically supplier pricing, and then you would often get a six hundred dollar Costco card thrown in to boot, and the promotion led to sales of 43,300 vehicles, and Costco estimates that it was a 69% closing rate. Wow. Now, now here's the thing that I don't get. I thought that, I mean, so, so basically Costco is operating as a middleman, right? It is. We're, weren't we supposed to disintermediate all of these sorts of things, that we wouldn't have these middle people anymore? Well, I mean, they, uh, clearly they deal in big volume, and um, I read that same article, and it, it said that they don't actually make any money on it. They're doing it as a customer loyalty measure, which 
is, is almost hard to imagine that that's true, but given, given taking it at face value that it is, it's pretty intelligent, it's pretty smart. How many stores for, for 43,000 cars in three months? I don't know. <laughs> okay, then. So there's. But you go to your it, Costco. You go to your Costco do it dealer. at dealerships, right? I mean, you go to your Costco dealer Sales or your Costco store, place, right? right? It's just a Buick store or the Costco. It, it Buick is, but you got to stand back and look at Costco sells more than that. They, I want to say, I don't know the number right off the top of my head, but somewhere between four hundred thousand and five hundred thousand vehicles a year. Yeah, I think they said 400. They, they were just shy of 400,000 this year, which is about double what it was in. And this, of course, is perfectly okay yeah. with the franchise dealers. Well, they, that are, no, they, they, they work business. through a franchise dealer. Legally, Costco cannot so just the delivery sell has to take through the place factory no. at the car store. Exactly right. right. But they buy through the <laughs> fleet, they offer a discount. And uh, we had a guy on Costco on our TV program, Out of Line, this week, two years ago, uh, who talked all about this. And. Uh, and he said at the same thing at the same time. We, we don't make any money on this. This is just a, a, you know, another thing to make people just love Costco. Hmm. Well, the one that I usually go to always has two cars parked out front, and they're never the same cars for very long. It's because these people are buying them like mad, Jim. They're just, they're just <laughs> taking them away. Well, apparently there's a line for automaker partners with this program that people are dying to get in and, and mm -hmm. shift a lot of cars. I, I would be interested to see what the breakdown of car types is. Um, I'm assuming they're big volume cars, Camrys, F-150s, that sort of Fusions, thing. Fusions, I've seen. Yeah. Sure, Fusions. well, you know, you, you know, think of it as Costco. You want to make sure you move these products right. so you go with what's most popular. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and the other thing, you know, Costco's model is you go in the store and you see something to think, oh, I'll come back next week and get it. No, next week it might be gone. So they create this, hey, i got to buy it right now kind of mentality with a killer price and it boy it works and they jump around brands so you can't just yeah. keep thinking well i'll come back and get that camry in another month no they'll have something else out there mm -hmm. it's a shame the re the return policy isn't as good on the cars as it is on the rest <laughs> of their products <laughs> see I, I i've always i've always figured that you know in the, in the future when you know the government runs out of money and things like that that like we'll buy health care at costco and we'll we'll all be good i mean it's just it's going to take care of everything <laughs> but uh, um so, so this week, the, uh, the new 7 Series, the new BMW 7 Series was unveiled in, uh, uh, in Germany at the BMW Welt. Um, and, and I thought that this, this was very interesting to me, I, I, that Harold Kruger, who is the chairman of the board of management of BMW, AG, said, um, we strive to attain perfection in everything we do. The result is always, quote, sheer driving pleasure, which guides us on our path to the future. Okay, and, and they, they kept emphasizing sheer driving pleasure instead of ultimate, ultimate driving, driving machine. machine. For the now, first time so, since ever. Yeah, and so, so, the, so then I was thinking, hmm, what's going on here? And it discovered that, that um, uh, he, he um, said, Herr Kruger said that uh, he was speaking of the 7 Series, and he said it all started in 1977. So that was the first generation of the 7 Series in 1977. At that time, I was just 12 years old. So the dude was 12 years old in 1977. So maybe he doesn't like machines. That's what I was sort of thinking of is, you know, that. Uh... Well, I think all these guys are kind of scared of autonomous driving. They know that they've got to go there, but until they do, you know, they've got to emphasize, you know, driving's good, driving's fun. So it, instead of emphasizing the ultra, ultimate driving machine, now they're talking about pure driving pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if that's got part of the reason or is part of the reason why he used this specific terminology. Yeah. Well, and they, they flirted with alternatives to the ultimate driving machine before. They had that joy campaign for mm -hmm. a number of years that was kind Didn't of, work. Kind of not so warmly received. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and obviously, they're, with the proliferation of models that they have, they're not just going after pure performance and, and driver engagement, the, the sort of you know, driving enthusiast um, brand that I think we all grew to love. Mm -hmm. They're doing things like the i3 now. It's a different approach, mm -hmm. um, and maybe no less valid, but certainly not as you know, viscerally entertaining to drive as as some of their other products in years past. So he's 50 now. I just did a little. Jim's good at math. math. He's good at math. Yeah. So weren't you running a major automobile company when you were 50? At 50, no. Yeah, no. no I was busy 49. doing other things, but. What, and he's relatively new. Mm -hmm. I mean, Norbert Reithofer 
he, he only left a little while ago, right? So All right, here's so this 50-year-old guy running this amazing machine, mm -hmm. and then the new 7, I think it's just a knockout. It's just gorgeous. Okay, we're going to leave here, and we're going to hear from our friends at Hyundai, if you can hear me over that music. <laughs> we could tell you about the years of research and development, how we forged advanced high-strength steel to make the frame stronger yet lighter, the countless hours spent testing the suspension and tuning every sound from the engine to the trunk. But until you get behind the wheel, you have no idea. The completely redesigned Hyundai Sonata. And we're back. So, so John, you were mentioning about um, the autonomous driving and, and new technologies and things like that. And, and uh, I, was, I was thinking when we had Sandy Monroe on the show talking about the i3 and talking about how the technologies that they were developing would be deployed in future vehicles. And uh, so also in his speech, he points out the, the new BMW 7 Series benefits from BMW i Technologies. For a start, the laser lights are derived from the BMW i8 and are now available for the first time in a large scale series production vehicle. Another first is the intelligent way in which different materials have been combined in this car. The body has a carbon core, which brings us exactly to that i3 thing. So is, is, do you think that BMW is going to be doing a really good job of leveraging its technologies that he's... You know, I, I want to find out what he means by a carbon core. I, I saw that, too. I've been traveling. I just got in from San Francisco. That's why I missed the first half of the show, although I did get a chance to say hello to Al Oppenheiser. But, um, yeah, what does he mean by carbon core? I'm, I'm getting the sense that basically what it is, what he's talking about is, is that the frame, that sort of the body in white is, is primarily made out of carbon fiber, and then the rest of the vehicle is a combination I would think of steel, the cabin floor. steel and aluminum and things like that. Well, you know, but, Sandy's point was that with the i3, he estimated that BMW saved something like $300 million in tooling costs mm -hmm. by going with carbon fiber, you know, which gets laid up and all that sort of thing instead of stamping dies, punching out steel. So very interesting that, that you know, rather than try to do a whole 7 Series like that, which might push costs crazily out of control, they're doing some aspect of the structure in carbon fiber, using the savings and learning how do you do this in mass production, or mm -hmm. certainly greater production than what they've done with the i3 or the i8. But I, I need to learn more about what they mean, because, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, when, when I read about that, the, the carbon core, I was like, ooh, well, I, I need to see pictures. I need to see exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. And then uh, Klaus Froelich, member of the Board of Management who's involved in development, says uh, its innovative combination of carbon fiber structures with steel, aluminum, magnesium, and plastic means the 750i X-Drive is 130 kilograms lighter than the previous model. So we had somebody calling in and asking why they didn't take more weight out of the Camaro, and they took 300, weight out they took, they took 300 pounds out of the Camaro. Yeah. And so if we multiply 130 by 2.2 pounds 250 pounds 250 pounds which means that they took more weight out of the smaller camaro than they took out of the larger bmw so i guess we could give the check mark to uh l hoppenheiser for and his boys for that and they're claiming this is yeah, a good a, show on, on both companies i mean yeah but i mean they, just saying that i mean are, if, if, if you have these small chunks. camaro how much longer is it going to be when there aren't any big chunks to be taken out mm -hmm. I, I as many know i am not a big fan of the 54.5 mile per gallon thing i think it's just stupid that the number is just on, on the, it might as well be a million <laughs> it's not going to happen so why don't we just back off to a more reasonable number that's somewhere on the edge of makeability? 54.5? Well, remember, th that's an, what they call an unadjusted number. Unadjusted, you know, sales-weighted, whatever, right. but it's just a... Right, and then you get down to each individual footprint of a car has got to be able to meet you know, an increase in... We'll see. You know, there's going to be this midterm review in 2017, I think it is. Mm -hmm. But that only affects the standard after 2021. And as you guys know, after 2017, the standard takes that hockey stick move. Right now, it's, it's actually kind of easy. Most everybody's running ahead of, this, uh, of schedule, mm -hmm. so to speak. 
But after 2017, the standard gets much tougher. It'll be interesting to see what, if any, automakers come out uh, against that, you know, maintaining that 54.5. There's oh. been some suggesting that, hey, we're going to have to really look at it. No, no one's come out against it yet. Right. But, you know, well, you if can't gas, be seen to be right, no, it's against politically it. loaded, for sure. Well, you know, but the thing is, gas prices are cheap. And, you know, in, in the last couple of days of uh, trucks Auto Line Daily, you know, we've shown that the green car segment is really shrinking fast. Hybrids and plug-ins sales are going down fast. EVs are actually going up. But the numbers are so small, it's not enough to offset the drop in hybrids and plug. Yeah, we sold five last year and eight this year, so that's a 60% yeah. increase. <laughs> you know, sorry. Well, it's probably uh, Tesla driving most of that increase in pure EV, too, right? Uh, no, it, you know, uh, uh, the i3, there, there's oh, new models, yeah. there's yeah. the Golf EV, there's the B-Class Mercedes. There's... The Meve, i Meve. <laughs> no, the i has been around. I'm saying new models that have oh, come new, in yeah. in the last year. The i3 is an excellent point, yeah. Jim, we just got we just got a message from Washington. They raised it to a million. <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was a good idea. See, you keep your mouth shut, Macron. <laughs> see, you just it's just see, uh, you the know. trouble I caused. <laughs> just a couple of sentences. All right, just, see, it's just unbelievable. And then, and then one of you just mentioned something like selling eight vehicles. So on last week's show, I made the point that the Toyota FJ Cruiser in the month of May they sold eight, and the people of Toyota pointed out to me that that car is going away, and that's why they only sold eight. Mm. So. My apologies to Toyota if you thought that I was being disrespectful to the FJ Cruiser. Then I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, but is it going away because the sales are down, or the sales are down because it's going away? Gary, John, we gonna... John, John said that. By the way, I want I yeah, want yeah. everyone to, I want everybody to know that I did not say that. Yes, sir. Can we stop fooling around now and get to the Ford Motorsports announcement scheduled for nine o'clock tomorrow? Eastern Daylight Oh, yeah, yeah. Time. So mm. talk about this, Jim, the big Le Mans announcement, right? It, <laughs> the, it, this has been leaking all over town since December, since before the auto show. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And? and Drum roll, please. Up until this week, <laughs> when everybody sent out the invitations, it's a be sure and get on our link so you can watch the international broadcast from Le Mans on Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning. So, and apparently Mr. Ford is there and Mr. Fields is there and some other people are there already to make the announcement that uh, we're going back into big time sports car racing with the GT, including the 24 hours of Le Mans next year. Hmm, that would and, be the 50th anniversary? Yeah, how about that? Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's actually on the nose is what. And so uh, the room, rumor has it that they will use the further developed Roush Yates twin turbo V6 in a car built by the people in Canada and not by Riley. Uh, by Multimatic. Multimatic. Which is also going to build the production version. Which is, and to be run by none other than Chip Ganassi, who's won the championship already with the EcoBoost engine. Mm -hmm. In the so, U.S. At, at Sebring. Right. But, but I, Ford's going to announce a four-car effort, is it not? And, and I thought they were going to contest the entire sports car championship in Europe. Indeed. That's as far, that's as much as I know. All right. So, was, so, okay. So, dribbling so, out in December and... Yeah. The, <laughs> Every time you confront one of them at Ford Performance about it, what what racing program? So so okay so so let's 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 gauge their odds against Audi. That seems well, to they're be. not in the same category. And they're in okay, GT. Okay. GT Pro. So who's so who are they up against? BMW, Corvette, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Ferrari. Yep. <laughs> it, it, it's a great series. I mean, yeah. it, it's probably got more manufacturer participation. Porsche. Mm -hmm. Porsche. Than, than any other racing category, and they look like the cars that are in the showroom, you know, except that they got numbers and stickers on them. So what do you think? How are they going to do? Miserably in the first year. I, so I mean, so they're going to go back, and it'll be the 50th anniversary year, and they're going to be yeah, sputtering I, to the finish? It's so, so difficult. I mean, I don't, even when you add up all the Roush Yates engine experience, all the Ganassi experience, Scott Pruitt's experience, as far as I know, he's the lead number one driver in the number one car. It's Le Mans. Something will bite you in your hiney <laughs> sometime during the night and probably halfway around the track so you mm -hmm. can't get back and it'll break.
what do you think? What happened? I agree with that. Um, you know, for, watching Formula One this year and watching the return of Honda and the struggles that they've had, mm -hmm. it's top top flight motorsports is brutal. And if you've got to come in, you've 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 got a whole new car and and all new technology in it. It's it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, just down the road here is Pratt and Miller, the guys that do the Corvette racing team. Boy, you think you're going to just go and beat them your first year back? I don't yeah. think so. After they've been at it for t 12 straight years but, but and won Ford's a whole bunch. got some, some really good experience, you know, with Ganassi, uh, you know, with Pruitt, Montoya, and the like. They, they won the 24 hours of uh, Daytona. And I, I think there's a lot of lessons learned that they're going to be able to translate right into this new GT. So I don't think that they're going to uh, acquit themselves horribly, but I don't expect to see them on the podium. Well, you can just imagine somewhere in that car will be the Bioflam valve. <laughs> that they got at great expense made out of stainless steel and it will break. <laughs> Maybe now it's not the 50 cent part anymore, it's the $35 part, but something will fail mm -hmm. and the car will sputter and that will be the end of the, uh, the effort. So I hope that yeah, I don't think they're going to take EPA four cars to Le Mans, are they? Uh, I don't know. You know, we'll learn tomorrow exactly what the plan is. But I, I thought it was going to be a four-car effort. I don't know if that was two in the U.S. and two in Europe or... The WEC and Tudor. Th that, that's what I'm... You can get an awful lot of learning done when you run four at a time. You can't. But it's expensive. So, Chris, what do you think I, about... Of course, I can't wait. I'm, I'm just vibrating with about excitement. This, you can tell. <laughs> with good he reason. He is vibrating in the seat. I'm a little concerned, but yeah. um, he didn't put a quarter in it. It's about bloody time. And... Uh, what do you think about Brian Nesbitt coming back to uh, head up Buick Design? I think it's an interesting move. Um, Brian, you know, is still relatively young, but he's had a tremendously long career already, and he's been a number of different places. I actually spent uh, a fair amount of time recently uh, with one of the people that was instrumental in, in his early days um, of, you know, getting going with the PT Cruiser and all of that. Um, I, and he, we were talking about him um, in, in the context of that appointment not being announced yet. Um, and... The, uh, the discussion was that maybe that he was pushed along too soon. He wasn't ready for a lot of those things um, that, that he got, and he got bounced around. He gave him a and, marketing job yeah. there for a while. And yeah. So th that'll be an interesting assignment. I think probably be more interesting um, design-wise than Bao Jun and, and some of the other Wu things. Wu Ling. Yeah, Wu Ling. So, so they're bringing him back from China. And is it, is it, but then it struck me, okay, they're bringing him back from China to go to Buick, Which and the China. rationalization <laughs> of Buick was always China. Yeah. So does this mean he's being brought, he's being brought back here because they said, you know, specifically said he's being repatriated, which was a surprising <laughs> word to see in a press yeah. release yeah. For an international about, about somebody, yeah. you know, bringing them back. Yeah. And it just, it's just sort of like, okay, why didn't they give him, I don't know, a job at another division? You know what I mean? Rather than, than is, it, is it because Brian has been over in... In, in China for the past several years and has a, a sensitivity to that. And then sure. I thought, well, look, you know, uh, Buick sells a million cars in China. That's way more than they sell in the U.S. So now, presumably, he's got some sensitivity as to what the Chinese consumer wants and needs in a Buick. And now, hopefully, can blend that with what Americans would want and need in it, too. And Buick needs help. Uh, its sales are down in the U.S. so far this year in a strong market. You know, it, mm -hmm. its sales are sputtering. And, uh, you know, we saw that heroic uh, halo car that they had at the Detroit show. What was the name of that thing? The Cascada Convertible? Not that. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wicked man. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I'd throw that in. No, here's the, it's the, up on the screen here. I'm blanking out. Gavin Ear? Gavin Ear. Yeah. You know, I, I, so, I mean, so last week when I ran out of here and I, I drove to Saugatuck, I was driving down 96 and I saw these two compact SUVs with, with um, M plates on them driving out 96, way past Wixom. And I was like, it looked a little bit like an MKC, like a Lincoln MKC. And now they were not camo, these were, these were cars. And so I, I got behind it and I saw the Buick badge. Mm -hmm. They were the Buick Envision. Uh-huh. Yeah, they've been running around like crazy, oh, largely I, undisguised I mean, what, a, what a beautiful car. I mean, I was just like. Well, they, they need they, that here. They need that here. They do. And they sell it in China. And they don't sell it here. And it was designed and engineered in the United States because I, I well, with your people, it's like, what the hell was that? Because it didn't say, it yeah. didn't have a name on it. And uh, Can we go back a couple of sentences to John's remarks about Buick? In Ch it, it, isn't the China market running up against some kind of a ramp here? 
then, then sales just kind of... No, no. The rate of growth is slowing down. Every other market in the world would just about kill mm -hmm. for the slowed down rate of growth that China's going You're talking to. about the overall China economy. Well, no, the Chinese car market. Well, it, w whether you want to talk about the Chinese economy or the car market, it's still growing strong. It's just not growing at the rate it had been. And China needs to have an economy that's growing at over 7% a year if it's going to absorb all these people coming off the farms and give them jobs. And if that don't happen, the revolution's yeah. going to break out well, that, again. That number was on the order of 12 a few years ago. It was. 12%, exactly which was right. nobody ever heard of an economy growing that fast, ever. No, and the, and the car market, same thing, 12 to 15%. And, and now it's, uh, it's slowed down enough that everyone's having to cut prices in China, which is the first time this has ever happened. Yeah, and, and in Russia, they're going, oh, That's what? a basket case. What? This, <laughs> I think their sales were down 34.7% in the month of May, literally. I, I'm not pulling that out of my notebook. Another you, you looked at it. I, did, I, didn't even, I didn't even look in here. I didn't even look in there. I didn't even look in there. All right, so we're at the top of the hour. So now that we've... Is there anybody left to excoriate or? Uh... Let's see. Ford Motorsports, Buick, China, BMW, Brian Nesbitt. You think we're good? I think, yeah. think we're good? I think that was a okay. you know, pretty good deal. Jim McCraw, thank you for being here. Mon plaisir. <laughs> Chris Pockert, good to see you again. Great to be here. And this, is, this is sort of like John is like, he's, he's like, a guest or something. I know. So I can I can say you know, gee, John, thanks for being yeah. here. <laughs> right. But well, yeah, but, but he, be he here brought next all week, of his next files week. with him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Next week, Greg Metros for the GT, the Ford GT stylist. Yeah. Are they yeah, going to bring one? Yeah. And and uh, I don't think we're going to get one. They probably have them all over there for the. Yeah. I was going to say I may I may break nuts. in here if you, they're going to bring. Oh them. yeah, no. But, it, uh, we'll call you if they say yeah we're going to bring a car. I'll let the, you know. Chris. The red one is. A, a pusher around her. It's all fiberglass. The red one that they showed us down in the deep bowels of the design center. Well, we'll see. So, okay, friend auto line at facebook.com slash auto line network, all one word, facebook.com slash auto line network. Follow auto line on Twitter at twitter.com slash auto line. And thank you all for joining us next week. Craig Metros for GT. Be here. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, Chrysler, and by Hyundai. Learn more at Hyundai.com. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. TV.